Okay, we, we have a new question, which is vitally urgent. <laughs> the microphone's over there. Just, just a curiosity question. I noticed that there's a rooster in a number of pictures with Ajahn Buddhadasa, and I was wondering if there was a significance. Um, sort of. But there's not a big symbolic significance. But they came, they became kind of a, uh, not a trademark, but he, he used to have a, every one Sunday a month, he would give the national radio sermon. And it would be recorded in advance and the tapes would be sent up to Bangkok. And often there were chickens in the background, so people, got used to when they hear him speak, they'd hear chickens in the background. Because the chicken, and one of the jobs, I, it wasn't my job, but there were a couple monks when these were being recorded, the job was to try to keep the chickens far enough away. Because um, when I would talk with him personally, I often tape recorded them, and sometimes a chicken would get on the table and start <laughs> pecking the microphone. So I've got some tapes of one of the chickens um, so often people would come to Suen Mok and they'd be really happy because, oh, the chickens, you know. So, so it became a kind of fun thing. Uh, to the extent it has significance is, one, the, the chickens first came because there was a kind of caterpillar that was eating the leaves on a lot of the trees around where his his kuti is is more than a hut at that time he, his original one was small but then a kind of office with library was built and so people gave him chickens to control the caterpillars and then the chickens reproduced and there were more and more chickens and chick Chickens are native to Southeast Asia. That's where they come from. So they're, they're kind of variations between wild, semi, semi-wild and domestic. So over, over the years then, he would speak of the chickens as having a duty at Suen Mok. So some of his talks on duty weren't just about the people, but the dogs had a duty, the chickens had a duty, and then, and then another part of it was he, there was a time when he raised fish and he liked to feed the chickens. So if you'd go to talk to him, sometimes he'd pull out rice and he'd be feeding the chickens. And he was usually feeding the little ones. He would shoo away with his cane, he'd kind of shoo away the older ones and, and feed the, the little chicks till they got bigger. And the way he liked to, the way he would speak about that is he raised the fish, the chickens, and dogs as teachers. And especially in Thai culture, to speak of dogs as teachers is a, a little, um, to turn the natural order upside down a little bit. But he, he liked to, he gave talks on, he liked to talk about the instinct. And he, he worked out some ideas of the relationship between instincts and, on one hand, defilements like greed, hatred, and delusion. And then the instincts and the parami, the perfections. And this connects to some of the stuff we've talked about where there is an ele- there's a trend in Theravada that sees kind of nature as this thing that keeps getting you reborn and therefore it's, it's seen in a rather negative light. And he, he revalued that in, in a variety of ways. And one way is to, to talk about, to borrow the modern notion of instincts from biology and talk about the instincts as just natural, natural forces in living things to keep us alive and that they're dhammically neutral. And that because, but it's when the instincts are taken over by craving and clinging and selfishness, 
then they turn into greed, hatred, delusion. So he was drawing a connection between the instincts and the defilements, but not making them equivalent, where the tendency is kind of to lump these things together and, it's, and then sort of paint it in a negative light. And then he would say, but the instincts, when seen with wisdom, can be guided into the perfections. So he would talk about the, the core instinct is the instinct to survive. And in Thai, the word for survival is also used by Christians to speak of salvation. So there's a nice pun on survival and salvation or awakening or liberation. And so he, he would speak of the natural religion or the religion based in the instincts is the instinct to survive. But survival is not just physical. There's mental and spiritual survival. So he he tried to reframe things like that. That um, that nature is just nature. It's it's what we and our minds do with it. And and so the chickens, the dogs, the fish, and the forest were were a classroom to help us learn about the instincts around us and and inside of us. Not that I recall. Oh, he 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 read some, especially in back in the 30s and 40s. He read a lot of science when he was younger. So, in general, Thai culture, do people that they're born with deformities or or um, genetic problems or like mutants, whatever, um, do those people are they treated or looked upon as having done something bad? Or, I mean, is there a stigma that's associated with that, or is it? Well, there are some ties here who might be able to speak more effectively. I would say there's not a strong stigma. The In the past, as far as I know, the tendency was to explain it in terms of karma. And I know of some particularly ugly ways that's played out around rape. But generally, people who are um, have downs or you know, I'm not sure what the right words for it is, but body parts aren't functioning the way people expect. Uh, that people, on one hand, kind of interpret it in terms of something they must have done in a past life. Yet there's a a certain, for some stuff, there's a certain amount of tolerance, at least in the village, and people were treated with kindness. But I think in the cities, they end up as beggars. Does anybody want to add to that? Um, it seems that if a person is born different and knows it, um, if they have any wits about them, they may seek a path to freedom because they recognize the impermanence and um, their own mortality, let's just say, a lot faster than someone who's just going along like everything's fine and i am you know, got a great situation here. So um, that's actually my personal experience is having been born with a genetic disorder. Mm. And it, it has you know, taken family members very early in life and left me with, you know, multiple operations and, and uh, all kinds of things. So, but it is actually spurring me on to seek freedom from suffering. I mean, it's actually been a catalyst. So I was just wondering if, if others in, you know, in the sort of other broader communities, rural communities, could say they uh, can, can look at it that way. Well, in 
Thailand, that perspective is relatively new. That, I mean, it's there now that certain things are identified as genetic, but that's pretty new the last 20 years. The, um, and, you know, in some of the big cities, maybe 30, 40 years ago, but that's, that's a way of thinking that's developed in our culture over the last hundred years. Over in Thailand, it's been much more recent and quick. So, and then, you know, a place like Thailand is because the pace of change has been much faster than here. You've got all kinds of mixes of people who are, some people have kind of done their best to get out of traditional worldviews traditional views and are pretty much accepting the the modern consumer culture in a very naive way or a blindly consumerist way. Others are trying to hold on to traditional views or all kinds of different mixes. And in Thailand, traditional doesn't always mean Buddhist. It's a mixture of belief in spirits, Brahmanism, and Buddhism. And these can, you know, in one family you can have a whole lot of different variations on that. And then genetics comes in, but how it gets incorporated can be interesting. Thank you. That was helpful. (laughs) Unless I've missed something... Um, so far, I haven't really heard about, um, and I'm interested in, the role of meditation practice in the way that um, Buddha Dasa taught. Uh, and within that, um, kind of his general, perhaps his general, uh, if he had one that he taught about the relative importance of jhanas or not, or whatever you'd have to say about that, I'd be interested in. Um, I had asked a question earlier kind of about how that compared to Ajahn Chah's teachings, and I know you don't want to necessarily get into that comparing thing, So, um, but I am interested in kind of how he holds that. I mean, mm-hmm. I think we know that there's quite a wide range, range of practice teachings, and I'm, I'm interested in kind of what his were about. Sure. Yeah, the thanks, this would be a good time to bring in that piece. Um, I want to contextualize the meditation part a little bit first in that he, in given what I said earlier about Dhamma and nature, Dhamma and law of nature and duty, there's a, he saw Dhamma practice very broadly as doing the duty of the moment. That's one way to put it, but If we, or the question about behaving appropriately or living appropriately from moment to moment, that's Dhamma practice. And so his understanding of Dhamma practice is much broader and I would say deeper than understanding Dhamma practice as meditation. So it's common in Thailand when people that Dhamma practice is a a euphemism or a synonym for meditation, but not for him. He understood it more broadly. And he would speak of meditation using other terms like pavana or bhavana, which means development, cultivation, and um, gamatan, which is a common term both in Pali and Thai for for meditation. <coughs> So, he did not make meditation the focus of his teaching, but it had a crucial place. So, again, the focus is on not clinging to me and mine. But, because he also talked a lot about dependent co-origination, he, he would use that and to point out that the place to not cling is in the moment of seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching, remembering, thinking. 
So what in Pali is called patsa or contact. So he spoke a lot and so did the Buddha about being mindful of contact and of the feelings that arise due to contact, pleasant, unpleasant and ambiguous feeling. So to practice non-clinging requires very good mindfulness. And he would allow that some people would just have good mindfulness somehow. Genetically, past lives, whatever would be the reason. But most of us need to train it. So that's one way he would encourage meditation. On the other hand, he accepted that a large number of the people listening to him were just weren't going to meditate. So if you know living Buddhist masters, the the section from Ajahn Buddha Dasa is something like meditation by the natural method. And this was from a series of lectures he gave for 14 years to, <clears throat> to men who were in training to be judges. I think there are women now, but back then it was all men. <clears throat> Excuse me. And the odds that more than a few of them would take up a regular meditation practice were small. So he was trying to interest them in something akin to meditation, even if they weren't going to get, you know, serious enough to have a regular daily practice. So some people have misinterpreted that to say, oh, you don't need to meditate. And there are people at Suanmok, including some monks who have that attitude. Um, but that's not what Ajahn Buddhadasa's ad approach was. But So anyway, his style was to point to deeper principles and then have you figure it out from there. So suffering happens because of clinging. If you don't want to suffer, do something about clinging. Clinging arises in response to sense contact and feeling. We need to be mindful of that or we'll never be able to avoid falling into the usual craving, clinging, and egoism. And the best way for most of us to develop the necessary mindfulness is some systematic practice. And for that, he strongly advocated on a panacity. Mindfulness with breathing in and out. And he talked about that frequently and there are, there are a couple books on that that have been translated, including one published here in the States called Mindfulness with Breathing. So, <clears throat> because of the place of anapanasati in the suttas, that's what he practiced. It's also breath, some kind of breath meditation is, is pretty common in, in many cultures. But in the suttas, it's the preeminent practice. We hear a lot from Burma about satipatthana, and that's true, but the actual system that the Buddha claims to have taught, practiced, and been awakened through is specifically anapanasati, and that's what Ajahn Buddhadasa stressed. So he wouldn't tell you you should meditate because he didn't like to be prescriptive about, he didn't like to use shoulds. But if you asked about the end of suffering, the conversation would eventually lead to, unless you've got something better, anapanasati's uh, a good idea because not only does it cultivate mindfulness of body feeling, it's not just about breath, it's about body feeling mind and Dhamma and the Buddha himself talked about it in various ways as an excellent way for quieting the mind, cultivating insight, realizing dependent co-origination and so on. He also talked about it in terms of developing 
samadhi. And he talked about samadhi or concentration or mental stability a little differently than um, the orthodox, the mainstream Theravada, which through the Vasudhi Magga, there's a strong um, samadhi and jhana are linked and mindfulness and insight are linked. And that's been especially emphasized here in North America where people kind of interchangeably use mindfulness practice and vipassana. That's an American innovation. It's not a traditional way of talking. Ajahn Buddhadasa's take is the Buddha taught samadhi for both jhana and insight. It's not an either or. And he saw the tranquility, serenity part in the insight part as two sides of the same coin. Or, although it's only two strands, he would use the metaphor of a, a rope. To have a strong rope, you need both both strands. Or So he advocated, <clears throat> or he taught about the jhanas, both because it's clearly they get a lot of mention in the suttas. So anybody who, like him, bases their teaching very much in the suttas, not in the later commentaries, you you just can't ignore the jhanas responsibly. Second, um, <clears throat> I'm pretty sure jhanas were, he was pretty experienced with the jhanas. And for a long time, he taught them more or less the way they're taught in the Vasudhi Magga. There are things about the Vasudhi Magga path of purity that he disagreed with, but not not that part. And so he, he talked about nimitta, the signs, and using the sign to cultivate deeper concentration and jhana and that 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 was well he didn't say that jhana was necessary again I hear people getting into kind of debates which they think are practical but sound to me more like theoretical because people are trying to convince one way or the other, do I need to do jhana or not? And for Ajahn Buddhadasa, that wasn't a very wise way to go about it. Just cultivate samadhi to the best of your ability and use it both ways. And for those of us who jhana is, there are some, it's relatively easy. And for some, it's, extremely difficult and for some of us maybe it'll never happen but we shouldn't frame samadhi just in terms of jhana samadhi is equally important for the sake of vipassana and so for him all of these are part of one practice it's not an either or the either or approach comes from the Vasudhi Magga and not from sutta it's not a sutta teaching, it's a, it's a later teaching, and I would say a distortion of the Buddha's original teaching. If I could comment a little bit, um, it would seem that he and Ajahn Chah were fairly close on this, uh, in that um, Ajahn Chah did not, I don't believe, even though I have not been taught him, taught him directly, but a lot by Sumedho and his people. Um, John's weren't something to be attended to with great importance. It was much more about continuity of mindfulness and, and, and continuity of mindfulness and bringing that from the sitting practice to everyday life and getting caught up in the achievements was a very, um, it was a wayward path. So it would sound like they were close on that. On those points, I would say very very close. The difference is more stylistic on, on those things. Ajahn Buddhadasa's style of teaching was sort of more scholarly, more erudite or whatever. Ajahn Chah was more down to earth, more 
more humorous or something. But but my understanding is he used barnyard uh, lessons all the time. The chickens may have been really around fun most, but the chickens were uh, Ajahn Chah's method of teaching. Mm-hmm. Ajahn Buddhadasa used a little of that too, but yeah. Well, that was common in the forest tradition, just using down-to-earth language. Partly because in Thai, Thai incorporated so many Pali words and at the same time changed the meaning. So a lot of Thais have trouble understanding the Pali terminology because they have, they have associations with meanings from modern Thai usage, which can, like Sanya, which is often translated perception, in modern Thai means to promise or make a contract or something. And sati or sati is more about being conscious or not than mindful. And so a lot of these words confuse people. So I've been told by many Thais, and I find this embarrassing, they would listen to me translating live for Ajahn Buddhadasa and say they understood my English translation better than his Thai. <laughs> Not sure what that's about. Maybe just trying to make the foreigner feel good. But I think part of it was language because I was translating and explaining the terms in English. Ajahn Buddhadasa was using the Pali terms assuming that people knew the right meaning and, and many, many didn't or never got around to that. But I I do want to, uh, since we don't have a lot more time, say that when, as far as a formal meditation practice, Ajahn Buddhadasa really strongly encouraged anapanasati. And, and not just being aware of the breath, but the whole system that the Buddha laid out. And Ajahn, I think more than anybody in Thailand, Ajahn Buddhadasa talked about the whole, so the whole 16 steps of the yes, yeah, which is a problem because for some it's daunting. There's, when we're struggling to just stay with the breath, and there's, you know, 16 more things to go. Because I would call just being aware of the breath lesson zero, <laughs> and then people would come. Why well, I can't even do lesson zero? This is hopeless. So I stopped calling it lesson zero, but. But yet, as if one really wants a map of a, a full practice, Anapanasati gives a very valuable one. So. Um, could you sort of share with us what uh, Tana John's opinion was of uh, two things, Buddha Gosa and the Abhidhamma? I read your translation of his dependent core origination booklet, and I think he spent two chapters sort of knocking Buddha goes it down a couple pegs, and I think he even made a comment that there's no need to read the Abhidhamma. He and I, and I also I was in a Thai monastery earlier this year, and I picked up the same sort of vibrations that Buddha goes it was not viewed very favorably, and reading the Abhidhamma was not fruitful. Right. Um, there's context to this. I'll give some of it. First, uh, Abhidhamma, that's a little easier. There's a, there are the people in Thailand who we can call the Abhidhamma fans. And in Thai, the word fan means lover. But uh, I also call them the Abhidhamma fanatics. Once, and Ajahn Buddhadasa liked to tease this group because in Thailand, Burma, Sri Lanka, there are legends around the Abhidhamma which just don't make sense. They're the kind of religious stories that, you know, things just don't connect. And it, which is really funny. You have a group of people who s- believe that they're following this very exalted, refined, philosophical take on the Dhamma, yet it's bolstered by a lot of beliefs that don't make sense, that cannot physically, logically happen. So once a group of them came down to Suan Mok to heckle him, 
um, for his usual Saturday afternoon lecture. So he chose his, changed his topic. He heard they were coming, so his topic was, what is Abhidhamma? And he didn't actually talk about Abhidhamma in the Tipitika, where the third basket, although it developed after the Buddha's death, traditional or Theravadins consider it to be um, authoritative and canonical. He didn't touch that at all, but he just debunked all these beliefs. But he also played around with the notion among certain students of the Abhidhamma that Abhi means higher. And so there's a certain pride in, I study the Abhidhamma. You know, I don't just study Dhamma, I study higher Dhamma. I'm not saying this is the majority. I've, I've met people who use the Abhidhamma as they understand it in a, a practical, useful way. But there's some, there's a lot of pride around it. So he was trying to puncture their balloon a little bit. So he translated Abhi as excessive. <laughs> or so too much Dhamma. And his point was it's overly philosophical. It's an attempt to rewrite the teachings in a completely non-personal way, which has a certain logic to it. The Buddha taught not self. Why are we expressing this teaching with conventional language about the Buddha and his disciples and this person and that person? Let's abstract the teaching completely. It has a logic, but I think practically it's not going to work for hardly anybody, if anybody. Um, and in college, I studied medieval Christianity, and it's just typical what in Christian traditions called scholasticism. People, monks who don't have anything better to do and just classify everything over and over again and keep refining their classifications. That's my take, but I should be honest and say I've never actually studied it. So I, I've just read texts that sort of summarize it. And that's true of most people who study Abhidhamma. They don't actually go to the original texts or translations of those texts because what I hear is hardly anybody knows what it's talking about. So they rely on later commentaries that re-explain it. And, and some people use that again in a, in a pragmatic and useful way. But, so he, he liked to poke fun at people who were proud of it. Um, for, for Venerable Buddha Gosa, an, an argument could be made that Buddha Gosa is the dominant figure in Theravada Buddhism, not the Buddha that Buddha Gosa's writing of the Vasudhi Maga and his supposed compiling of the commentary system, he and a few of his students, meant that what has become the dominant Theravada interpretation was more the work of Buddha Gosa than the Buddha. Now, Orthodox Theravada, now what I'm saying is somewhat controversial, but there are more and more people who would agree with at least some of what I'm about to say. Orthodox Theravada says that Buddha Gosa is the best explanation of what the Buddha was said, and there's, there's no important difference or contradiction. Ajahn Buddhadasa was one of the first to, he wasn't the first, um, the so-called Prince Patriarch, who was a prince who became Supreme Patriarch, he also had a few mild uh, critiques of the Vasudhi Maga and that maybe Buddha Gosa missed a few things. And Buddha Gosa himself in the Vasudhi Maga admits that he doesn't understand everything he's writing about and that he's as much passing on a tradition. So he's rather humble He's, from what I understand, he's pretty humble in his style. 
but that became the dominant um, interpretation. And there's recent scholarship about the politics behind all that, which generally in religion, the official religious line ignores the politics. No matter how bloody the backroom fighting in the Vatican has been, the official picture is one big happy family. But um, there's been politics involved in what became dominant in Theravada teaching. This goes back a thousand years to Sri Lanka. Now, there are many who would flatly deny what I'm saying, but there is historical evidence for some of it. So, Anjan Buddhadasa, very early on, started to notice that there were differences between the emphasis of the commentaries of which the Vasudhi Maga is central and Buddha Gosa is the main, is the name attached to all of that, that there are differences between that and the suttas. And as time went on, he came to see that as more and more important. So much later, he's in the book you're referring to, Practical Dependent Origination, which, by the way, I did not translate. A guy named Steve Schmidt translated it. The, he was willing to say publicly that, well, actually, and that came from a talk given in the 70s, that Buddha Gosa was 90, about 95% correct. But on 5%, he was still kind of a closet Brahmin because Buddha Gosa was born in a Brahmin family in southern India. There's not a lot known about his, his, his bio, but that, that's one of the little bits known. And Ajahn Buddha Dasa would surmise that maybe he still held some of his pre-Buddhist beliefs, including that there's, a, there's something that sort of is reborn from life to life. Because where Ajahn Buddha Dasa most strongly disagreed with Buddha Gosa was in the, what's sometimes called the three lifetimes interpretation of dependent co-origination. This originates with Buddha Gosa. Or, if not him, the commentaries, the Sri Lankan commentaries that he used and then I believe, destroyed once they were translated into the commentary form of Pali. So the interpretation of dependent co-origination as part of it being about past causes, then present results, present causes of future results or effects, that's not in sutta. You can read the suttas that way if you want, but Ajahn Buddhadasa felt it was more useful to read the sutta discussion of dependent co-origination as the rebirth of I and mine over and over again each day. And he felt that to expand the frame of it to many lifetimes, it has no practical value. How can you practice about something that was caused in your last life and it's not going to bear fruit till the next one. So he thought that in understanding of dependent origination that you could see it happening in this life and you could intervene in this life was much more realistic. And yet if there is some sort of rebirth, let's stop talking about it in a way that implies a some entity that is reborn, which it seems to me most Buddhist explanations of rebirth end up implying a self of some sort. Even though they go on and on about how it's not self and empty, there tends to slip in because the language is about beings being reborn, you end up with entities. And Ajahn Buddhadasa felt that that undermined the purpose of dependent origination, which is to see how things can follow a process without there being any entity. 
And so to turn it into a rebirth story that is st- imply, if not more openly in state, something or someone who's reborn. Because over, you, you never, you don't, well, there are passages where supposedly somebody died and then the Buddha would speak of that person reappearing somewhere. Um, so there are passages like that for those who want to bolster the the argument that the Buddha taught rebirth in that way. But Ajahn Buddha also felt it was more useful to see it in terms of this life. And so he thought that that was the big mistake, mistake of the, the Sudhi Magha. And then along with that, one of the the vis- the commentarial tradition shifted the emphasis from a focus on practice now, which is how I read the suttas, to a more conventional religious thing about rebirth, right and wrong. It's more moralistic. And it's not that, you know, morality is not important, but it seems the con- whereas the the early concern is about liberation from suffering here and now, the commentaries turn it into this long drawn out process, and it's implied that most people aren't going to get very far, so you should focus on accumulating merit and then you get into the what became the sort of Theravada or the Buddhist class system of the monastics who really practice and then everybody else who, you know, the best you can do is make some merit and hope for a better life next time. So I'm compressing a lot, but but Ajahn Buddha Dasa wanted to get Thai people out of that frame and say, no, we, we can do something about suffering here and now. Um. Just one additional question relating to practice. Did a, how did Ajahn Buddha Dasa feel about the Kasina practice, which I think is not in the suttas, but is talked about in uh, by Buddha Gosa? He, he never criticized it. He mentioned it like most teachers would because it had become part of the orthodoxy. The Kasinas are mentioned in suttas, but they're not they're not taught in the sense that they're explained how to do it. They're just mentioned and not that much. Whereas in the Vasudhi Magha, they become among the 40 objects of meditation. And then Achin Buddha Dasa didn't say as much about this as I'm going to. But the Vasudhi Magha takes Kasina as the paradigm of meditation practice. And so what Ajahn Buddha Dasa did indirectly is to, he wrote a book that put Anapanasati back as the paradigm. Um, as he didn't, when he didn't write an introduction that said, this is my attempt to correct Buddha Gosa's mistake. Um, but in a way that's what he did, which is, to take the meditation practice that the Buddha talked about the most and, and use it as the model rather than Kasina, which Buddha Gosa chose because scholastically it's simple and convenient. What is the book uh, on mindfulness of breathing by Ajahn Buddha? What? Which book is that? The there's a, a, a larger book that was translated and is pretty much out of print, although there's a, it's available on P, in PDF from BuddhaNet, at least three quarters of it. Unfortunately, I'll, I'll, there's a book called Anapanasati Bhavana, and it was dictated in the, like, I think it's 56. 1956, back before there was a tape recorder at Ajahn's 
at Suen Mok. So he would say it line by line and monks would write it down. And it's kind of his op- scholarly opus on, on a panacity. The one that's available here is a, a simpler, but I would say more practical approach. Whereas in the one I'm referring to, which in Thai is 500 pages long, the, it's got a, he pulls together all the commentary information, all the Vasudhi Maga, all the Sutta. And so if you're really into it, like I am, it's a great book, but it's more than most people would want to plow through. And unfortunately, when it was published, the printer lost the last third. So it ends abruptly in two thirds of the way through lesson 13. So, but if you go and get the PDF from BuddhaNet and then want to read the last four chapters, I've got it. So it's, I, I haven't finished polishing it for publication, but I've got good draft translations, almost publishable translations. So. Yeah, yeah. With a promise not to circulate. Too widely. <laughs> I'm not too proprietary about it, but I would like to get it published one day. You know the reference to Kuna, what's the translation? I don't know. Does anybody know a good... Yeah, I've been tossing around terms. Apologies for anybody who's unfamiliar with Buddha Gosa, Vasudhi Maga, Kasina. I don't know what it literally means, but um, there are things like earth casino or some of them, traditionally they're clay discs that would be dyed yellow, blue, red with like some natural powder. And then they would be used as a visual meditation object that you would pretty much stare at it until you could retain the image with your eyes closed. And then water casino, you would, you would put water in your, like for monks, in the, the lid to their begging bowl, and you'd put water, and you would kind of take in the water until you could have that image clearly with your, your eyes closed. And that's what Buddha goes to compare against the Anapada. He didn't compare, but he wrote, he, he wrote about one of the Casinas, I think it was the white casino, and use that as the model for how to develop concentration. And then he then, once he had that model, he kind of used it as a template for a bunch of other practices. So he kind of crammed anapanasati into that model. And I, I thought, I think he did damage by doing so. Not irrevocable, fortunately. So it's kind of like the casino becomes the nirita. Right. In casino practice, nimita is it's part of the whole process. And now some people are questioning, is that so important? Ajahn Buddha Dasa, nimita means sign, the, the image you can see with your eyes closed. Actually, the original object is called nimita because it just means sign. So, in anapanasati, the breath is the the original sign. It's called parikama nimita. And then there's a, a... I always get these mixed up. And then there's the acquired sign, and and then you kind of lock it in place. And it's... Somebody help me. Who knows the... Ukaha nimita, the... Anyway, sorry, I always get these... Some terms I memorized wrong a long time ago and I can never get it right. Anyway, nimita means different. It can mean the original object, then kind of the original image created based on that object, and then after you've manipulated that image into a form that is very good for jhana, that's the third kind of nimita or sign. But they're often taken to be visual images. 
and Ajahn Buddhadasa often spoke of them that way, but but also mentioned, and I think the Visuddhi Magga does, they, they are not necessarily visual. But in the case of Kasina, they're, they're always visual. But with Anapanasati, maybe not. But nobody knows for sure. <laughs> so one of the topics with a variety of opinions. Okay, I've got a few things left on the list here. Um, is the person who asked about Burma still around? Okay, I'll skip that one. There's not a lot to say. He he only went to Burma once to give a lecture. Um, there was a big kind of convention celebrating the midway point between Buddhas. It's believed that there was 5,000 years between the last Buddha and the next one. And so the year 2,500, there were lots of activities in Sri Lanka, Burma, and Thailand. And at one of them, Ajahn Buddhadasa was the official Thai representative because he was able to give a give a speech in English. And there he met um, Mahasi Sayadaw, with whom and they had a few disagreements. <laughs> and he was taken to uh, the, the center of Uba Keen, who was Goenka's teacher, that's in Goenka's teacher. And Ajahn, he was shown a room full of people, this is how I heard it from him, who were crying. So they were probably doing, some of you at lunch were talking about the strong determination hour. So Ajahn Buddhadasa was baffled by that. He said, well, you know, what's the point of sitting around crying for, for an hour? So, um, I'm sure there's more to the Uba Keen system to that, but that's, uh, that's what I remember hearing. So, um, It's 4.10, why don't I respond to the question about the period around his death and some of the things that went on there. And I, I can get somewhat emotional about this, so I don't get as angry as I used to. But uh, it was 13 years ago, and personally for me a very difficult time because what it what had happened was his health had been failing um actually since his mid sixties he broke his a leg very badly he fell down and broke a leg very badly and after that he couldn't get around so much his weight increased a lot and and then by the time of his eightieth birthday he had heart problems partly because he was overweight and so he lost a lot of weight and that problem went away. He had diabetes for a week. It was kind of interesting. That some doctors came and tested him and they were going around saying he had diabetes. So he had, when he was a temple boy, he learned a lot about herbs from the abbot of the temple in his where he grew up. And uh, there's a kind of morning glory that's um, called pak bung, which is a very basic and common and cheap vegetable in Thailand, in a way like spinach, um, before the recent <laughs> thing. And so he, and like spinach, it's got a lot of vitamin A or whatever. So he, he told people, give me a lot of pak bung. And so he ate a lot of pak bung and his blood sugar level went down really quick. And so the doctors say, oh, he doesn't have diabetes now. And so rumors spread of the miracle cure for diabetes. <laughs> now, exactly what happened, I don't know, but he did eat a lot of pak bung and the little test they were giving him stopped, stopped showing positive. And then um, he started having some strokes. And most of them were minor 
and he would bounce back pretty quick. But in April of 93, oh wait, uh, maybe it was December, anyway, somewhere within the last six months of his life, he had a pretty serious stroke and he had trouble remembering things. Previous strokes, he could remember things pretty quick and was could give talks a day or two later. But this one knocked him back pretty bad and the neurologists estimated he lost 40% of his neocortex, which sounds like a lot. And he, but he bounced back from that really well, which I attribute to his lifestyle and um, a highly trained mind that sort of the rewiring of the neurons was able to go along pretty quickly because he wasn't wasting energy in much greed, hatred, and delusion. And there was good samadhi to back it up. So he bounced back pretty well from that after about a month. But his his health had been shaky for the last couple years. And so in his birthday was... May 27th, and he was approaching his 87th birthday, and uh, he was doing okay. And just before his birthday, he was getting lots of visitors, because it was a time when people would come to pay respect, old students would show up who, if they hadn't seen him for a few years, that was a common time to come down. And there was one guy who hadn't been there for years. You, you remember the pond I mentioned with the single coconut tree? That was dug by one man. And after he dug it, he started getting uh, making demands around the place. It's like, well, I, I dug the pond. I'm special. So Ajahn Buddhadasa said, to, said, fill up your pond and leave. <laughs> the guy got very upset and left. He didn't fill up the pond. And so he didn't come back for a while. Um, but after a number of years, he'd come back and then he was gone for a long time. And so they stayed up pretty late talking. And uh, and that and all the vil- uh, visitors wore him out quite a bit. So he woke up. Um, he was going to give some talks on the 25th. And... He woke up at his usual time about four o'clock when the electricity comes on. There's a cutoff in the whole monastery. There's electricity from four to six a.m. and six p.m. to ten p.m. So he had an old typewriter he was given when he was a young monk in Bangkok and he still used that for the rest of his life. So before a Dhamma talk, he would make notes. He didn't always follow them, but he almost always typed up notes. So he was typing and um, a major stroke hit him that morning. And so he called for his attendant. He, as he put it, my tongue is swelling and he it was becoming difficult for him to speak. The attendant got the assistant abbot. Ajahn Buddhadasa passed on his keys, which was very symbolic. It was like, okay, <laughs> I'm not going to be responsible around here anymore. You are. So he handed this set of keys to the abbot and soon after that could no longer speak and a little while later was unconscious. So uh, I was not there. I was across the highway at the little the little monastery that I was overseeing called Don Kiem. And so... Um, So anyway, he was pretty much in coma maybe by seven or eight. He was taken to the local provincial hospital because when this happened, a a student who was a doctor in the local town was called. And when that guy came in, he followed, he was retired from the Ministry of Public Health, but he followed the system and he called somebody And once he called in the system, wheels were put in place. And he basically was taken off to the provincial hospital 50 miles away, even though he'd repeatedly made it clear 
he didn't want to go to the hospital for treatment. He felt the Buddha lived to be 80. After 80, you know, he didn't want to mess around. So he even would speak as if he was embarrassed to outlive the Buddha. It didn't mean he wanted to die, but he was a little ambiguous about hanging around. But um, for reasons now out of his control, uh, he was taken to the local hospital and it took us a little while later it was realized that that wasn't going to do any good and it took about two days to extricate him, um, which wasn't too hard, but it, it took time. Even though some of the doctors there understood him very well, didn't really want him there, but it was as much the way the system works. It's a top-down, Bangkok-centered system and when it's a very important national figure, the local people have to be very careful because they can catch flack from Bangkok. And you never know when a poli- you know, the Terry Chavo case, you never know when some politician's going to jump in and do damage. So, and by this time I was involved, but I wasn't a central player. We extricated him and brought him back to Suen Mok. However, at that time, then representatives from the main, one of the big teaching hospitals in Bangkok came down. And later I was told by this guy, he was sent down with orders to get Ajahn Buddhadasa to Bangkok no matter what, which eventually meant lying. Um, so he made a bunch of promises that no responsible doctor should have made that if you bring him to Bangkok, he has an excellent chance of recovery. If you keep him at Suen Mok, there's no way he can recover. The monastery is dirty. It's full of germs. If you bring him to Bangkok, it's clean, which is the biggest lie. This is a teaching hospital, so every germ, you know, you've got lots of sick people in this place. And once he was there, all the doctors and nurses wanted to come pay respect. So the first two days he was there, you know, people coming from every ward of this big hospital were coming in and they did not, you know, do any sanitation procedures. They just came in, paid respects. And, you know, there wasn't a whole lot to do about it. And in retrospect, I don't think it mattered because in my mind he was already gone. But... So there were a lot of um, promises made that could not be kept and behind the scenes threats were made. And um, the doctors were, you know, making little noise about the king. You know, the king wants this and we don't know how much that's true, but they were using some, in, in this situation, some rather dirty tricks. And the... Acting Abbott was in a very difficult position, both who he was. There are a lot of people had in Thailand by this time, 1993, had fully bought into modern medicine as savior. So there's a whole cultural shift that had gone on where all the brightest and best college students studied medicine. That's no longer the case. Now they do computers. But... In the 70s and 80s, you went into medicine. So there are a lot of people who were afraid to contradict doctors. You know, if doctors say something, you got to believe it. And the few of us who, um, there's a, so eventually the, this one doctor was convincing the abbot, you got to take him to Bangkok. And the abbot was close to going along and I fortunately dropped by. I'm going to stick my nose into things. And I suggested that it would not be a smart move on his part to agree all by himself. So a meeting was called. And the doctor put forth his case. A few of us raised, I asked a lot of questions. I was told later that there were people who wanted to beat me up for asking all the questions because they saw me as obstructing taking Ajahn Buddhadasa up to Bangkok and curing him, which would have, you know, there wasn't much chance of that. 
And for some of us, although most of the monks, because I was a foreigner, I could open my mouth. Most of the monks did not feel that they were in a position to say anything, but the majority felt that this was not in Ajahn Buddha Das's wishes, that he had said many, many times that he was not interested at his age in having much um, modern health care. If the body's ready to go, let it go, was his attitude. There's no need to hurry the process, but going up to Bangkok and spending a lot of money to keep an old body alive was not in his interest. And especially if he would have not been able to work. For him, the whole thing about Dhamma's duty, I didn't talk much about the theme that doing work with the right attitude is also Dhamma practice. His work was teaching. Um, he no longer wrote, but but teaching and reflecting on Dhamma was his work. And if he couldn't do that, he didn't see any purpose in staying alive. But uh, the social forces, such as they were, had more power in this situation. And so he was taken up to Bangkok. And um, I called it a kidnapping um, because in some respects it was. It was... I, uh, many of us believed against his wishes. And we found out once we were in Bangkok, many of the doctors at the hospital agreed. It was only a small coterie in the administration. And so in, unfortunately his death became politicized by, this was hap this is my own, um, assessment, but I'll, you'll, I'll give it to you. At this time, or starting in the late 80s, many doctors had invested in private hospitals. And so the, the most, for a long time, there were certain Bangkok hospitals, including the one he was taken to, which is Thailand's first modern hospital called Siri Rat. That was the most prestigious hospital for a long time. But by the late 80s, around maybe mid-80s, certain private hospitals had become the place where wealthy people went to. And they no, no longer went as nearly as much to the, the government-owned teaching hospitals. The medical staff was the same because they would often be required to spend some time in the government hospital, but they made their money in the private hospitals. And so what happened was if, if wealthy people would go to a private hospital and get better, they would make donations. So as Thai society increasingly believed in high-tech medicine, the private hospitals had the high-tech and the government hospitals didn't. And we, we found this out because we were squeezed to donate equipment to the hospital. Oh, he needs this, but we can't afford it. It'll only cost $50,000 or something. Um, and there was an old monk who was 100 years old in the same ICU we were in. In the ICU, there were six beds and three private rooms. And I lived in the ICU for six weeks with two other monks who were the, att the other attendants. And Ajahn Buddha Dasa was in one room the middle room was for us to kind of hang out. And then the third room was this hundred-year-old monk. And his disciples had bought a lot of equipment for the hospital. A million baht worth. That's 40,000. So what they wanted us to buy was not a, not 50,000, maybe $10,000 worth. So, um, so what my take is, and I could... There's also stories about the king, but I'm, I'm not going to get into those. But the, for the government hospitals to maintain their prestige, senior monks in the royal family were the way to go because the rich people were going more to the, to the private hospitals. But to keep some level of prestige and bring in some money, um, it, senior monks were 
were important kind of culturally and politically. And then there were uh, some other superstitious beliefs at play as well. So, so, in the, so they got him up to Bangkok and stubbornly, although a long string of doctors would quietly come to us and say, it's hopeless. The nurses in the ICU all gave up after a week. They said, we've seen a lot of these. There's no way he is going to survive. And it depressed them. So after about a week, the nurses really didn't want to take care of them because it depressed them and they were embarrassed. You know, because they they said, you should take him back to the monastery. And increasingly, the medical staff was saying the same thing. Unfortunately, the two top doctors of the hospital who had political clout, um, because one was the official royal doctor, he was an anesthesiologist, and the the owner of Ajahn Buddhadasa's case, which is how it's put in Thai, Thai, the owner of the case, they all, for their personal agendas, I think, most of all, wanted to keep him. And so, all the promises they had made about sanitation, no blood transfusions, no surgery, so no respirator, all of these were broken. So he was on a respirator, never got off. Um, he got pneumonia because hospitals aren't so clean. Um, they, they wiped out the first case of pneumonia with antibiotics. The second case, they almost didn't get. Um, they tried all the modern antibiotics and finally they tried a real old one. But all the antibiotics wiped out his liver. Um, so he needed dialysis. And so by the end, he was almost on daily dialysis. That meant blood transfusions. And so it was just this cascade of effects, which the doctor said, well, that's just how it is. Um, and in the beginning, the promises were made by people who, who should have known that to people who had no way of knowing that. And those of us who knew a little of it, myself and one one very close disciple who was a doctor, um, she was pressured a lot to shut up. And um, so so in the end, uh, due to the pneumonia, the kidneys, the liver failing, it was funny. There was an expert for each part of the body. So every day the heart doctor who, I became friends with some of these. The heart doctor would come in every day, check the heart and go, my organs okay because <laughs> it it was really i mean it brought out some of the weird stuff about the modern medical system as it's practiced in Thailand all the over specialization there'd be a string of doctors each just focusing on one part of the body none of them saw the whole picture there were other doctors who did but they weren't on the case or they were only minor, like the PT, the physical therapist would have to come in and massage him and give him little jolts of electricity to keep up the muscle tone. Um, I learned a lot about some of these things. Uh, he and I became buddies, because when you're hanging out in the ICU all day, you know, you talk with doctors and nurses a lot. But in the... Um, it's past 4.30. There's a lot more to this. Um, I'm leaving out some of the more unpleasant bits. But in the end, the body was just falling apart. And many of us believed if there wasn't the hospital intervention, he would have died within a day or two at Suen Malk. Things would have been clean and simple. As it was, in the end, after the kidneys and liver went, then soon after septicemia, which is infection of the arteries, I guess, or the veins, the blood system. And then that's when the doctors finally gave up. By the way, there were sec- the medical team would meet every day. None of us could go to the meetings, including the students who were, who were doctors. No, it was, well, we wouldn't understand, but that wasn't really the issue. 
And so decisions were made very autocratically and we had no say in it. And the message that was given to the press was spun quite a bit and was distorted. And unfortunately, the Thai newspapers did not have reporters who knew medicine. So the doctors could babble irrelevant numbers and the reporters would be writing them all down and they'd be front page news, pulse, blah, blah, blah. Well, there's a machine that's maintaining the pulse. It means nothing. Respiration, normal. Yeah, because there's a machine doing it. You know, it's all being controlled. It means, you know, so anyway. Um, so finally, septicemia came in. There was a call put into the royal palace. The king requested the government to provide an Air Force hospital jet, um, a convoy of ambulances to the airport, and then we put his body on a plane, just like the one that brought him up to Bangkok. And there were delays at the local airport and delays at the monastery. And so he was sitting in a van and they were trying to get the respirator working in the back room and it wouldn't work. And finally they got him into the room and he died within 10 minutes. And there were three of us in the room at the time and the two doctors were so busy fiddling with the respirator that didn't work, they didn't even notice he died. So, so um, as this was building um, for the consequences other doctors at other hospitals, as well as a very highly respected doctor, Dr. Brawait Wasi, who's, who I met then and got to know very well afterwards, um, who's highly respected senior kind of activist um, person in Thailand. A number of articles started coming out in the paper, some highly critical of what had happened, others like by Dr. Wasi, who um, studied in the States, were not so critical but raised questions. And in the year after his death, a lot of seminars were held by progressive Buddhist groups about the meaning of death, uh, a translation of the Tibetan Book of Living and Dying came out. A lot of articles were published by Buddhists, by doctors, and there was a, a huge debate, a pretty large debate that came out of this. Um, I was quite happy. In the midst of it, I wrote a letter to the doctors, which is on the Suenmok website, <coughs> where I tried to explain what Ajahn Buddhadasa meant by um, by the Ajahn Buddha Dasa used the phrase Raksa Doi Witi Tamachat, which Raksa is to care for using natural methods. And the doctors kept saying, Oh, well this is a natural method and this is a natural method. And they were just making it up as certain doctors. It's this is only a few. Most of the doctors were really cool. But a few of them were uh in their own world. And they would make this stuff up. So I wrote a letter trying to explain what Ajahn Buddhadasa meant by, and I wrote it in English, what he meant by um, medical care in the natural way. And uh, this got used in medical ethics courses for a number of years. It might still be floating around. So that was part of my piece, but a lot of, discussion um, occurred. I don't think great progress has been made, but there's now more availability of living wills and things like that in Thailand. There's, due to this and other factors, there's more, much more awareness of alternative medicine a return to traditional herbal medicine had been going on already. That and some other things have picked up speed. 
and now more of the Thai, more hospitals offer an alternative. You can do modern or traditional, or in some cases, a mix of the two. And the lessons around his death had a, a big part of that. Partly because although other senior monks had died and spent a lot of time in the hospitals, Ajahn Buddhadasa had been uh, an influence on Thai intellectuals more than a lot of the other teachers. It's not to say that he was a better teacher, but that was an area where he had a big impact. And so a lot of the editors of the main newspapers were more interested than him than most other monks. So that's one of the reasons he was front page news for like two weeks. In, in the Thai language papers. And then I forget some political event happened and that bumped it from the front page. So that's uh, a little bit or maybe more than you bargained for on, on that one. So it's uh, 4.40 so we can officially close or carry on um, or informally for those who who have any other questions. Is there anything on the last part about the hospital thing or was that more than enough? We've seen it all here. Yeah. Um, that another, he stipulated in a will that he be cremated within three months. He, the official date of death was July 8th and he was cremated about 10 weeks later, which is not very common. Usually in Thailand they would wait a, a year. But he didn't want any of the usual hullabaloo and fundraising. He wanted it done as simply as possible. And so he, he made a will to that effect. Otherwise, it would have been impossible for the abbot. The abbot was under tremendous pressure to do it in the the big deal way. And as it was, like 10,000 people showed up for the funeral, even though it was only announced publicly that morning. And still a lot of people showed up. Many of us knew it was coming. I knew, the you know, some of us knew and others guessed because there was during the rains retreat every year, there's a day that was by the lunar calendar where it was traditional that old students would come to pay respect. And so that day was chosen and a lot of people guessed. Anybody who was close kind of knew that that was a good bet. So publicly we just said it'll happen within three months. And a, a lot of people put two and two together. But a few said, oh, no, there's no way they would do it now. And they got really upset when they missed the funeral or the cremation. In his case, he also had a crypt built, which he kind of designed by itself. So there was a small box a little bigger than a concrete box with no bottom inside a much larger box and the larger box including underneath the smaller box was filled with sand so the casket went in the smaller crypt which was covered with a concrete lid and then around it was sand and so as Basically, because he, all the body fluids would drain out into the sand and it didn't give off an odor. And so when the, the thing was opened, that was one, I mean, the press was looking for miracles. So it was, it, I thought it was kind of ludicrous. The body doesn't smell. So that was, you know, miracle one. And miracle two was, the electricity went out. This was reported in Bangkok newspapers as a miracle. You know why the, the electricity went out? Because there are so many press with video cameras in these obnoxious spotlights that they blew the generator. 
So, anyway, that's a little bit about Thai Buddhism in the modern world. So it was interesting that he inadvertently, I don't think it was by any means his intention, left a little, few little lessons even in his, his dying. And it's interesting how that can happen. So. Shall we close? So, uh, thank you all for coming. Um, I'm very grateful to Sati Center for hosting this. This is his centennial and it's meant a lot to me to try to do some things like this to um, let people know more about him, his teaching, and um, hopefully uh, more translations will come out before too long if you want to follow up on that. And there's some stuff on the Suen Mok website and there's also some audio by him on the liberationpark.org website and that's where I am, that's my project, there are brochures on the table and some of the booklets might still be there, please please take one or, one or two.